Hey, uh, welcome to Mercy Church. My name is Eugene. I get to lead uh, this wonderful church. Uh, and God is so good. And thank God for answered prayers. Amen. Hey, uh, we've been in a series called Spiritual Disciplines, Seven Life Habits or Christian Habits that we are encouraging all of us to adopt into our lives and uh, I've been enjoying a lot, it a lot. Uh, you might say, well, that's because you've been preaching five of them. But I do believe that this is so powerful and so needed into our lives. And so, as you remember, we've been living with this one graphic. And it's this, that our heart leads to action. Whatever is in your heart will automatically come out in your words, in your thoughts, in your actions. But when we stop there, that sounds a little bit fatalistic, like, boy, I guess whatever is is in my heart is in my heart, and I can't do much about it. If I don't love God, I don't love God. If I don't honor his word, I don't honor his word. If I don't love people, I don't love people. If I don't have peace, I don't have peace. I guess it is what it is. And we're learning that what's also true is that our heart leads to action, but then our actions in return shape and form our desires, our love for Jesus, our love for one another. And the big idea is what happens when Mercy Church adopts these seven spiritual disciplines of prayer and Bible reading and serving and giving, and evangelism, and simplicity, and submission, and what will that do to our hearts? These are action steps, and I'm so proud, and I'm so thankful to God that He has brought us through, and we are finishing today, and I want you to think this one question. This year, what's going to be your signature habit that you're going to adopt and get better at? What is it going to be? Now, if you're like me, you're like, I want to do all of those, and I'm going to try my best, and then like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's one thing, one thing you're going to get better at this year? For me, the answer, just being honest with you, it's prayer. I want to be known for prayer. I want to rely on God. I want to learn to pray, and I want our church to learn to pray and rely on God. So what's yours? And if I meet you after church, I'm going to ask you, what's yours? What's your habit? What's your spiritual discipline you're going to adopt this year? 2022 is going to be a year of incredible transformation. Well, today, our last topic is on submission. I'm going to read with you from 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 22. When Saul returned from following Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Negedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here, and we'll get into the context, but they're saying, here is the day which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king, And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day 
Your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt for my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, Out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and you see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So the Lord will reward you for good what you have done this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king, and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring from me. They will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Let me pray. Father, I pray that you bless our church. Lord, as we dive into this subject, there's so much pain and hurt. There's a need for nuance and wisdom. But Father, most importantly, there's a need for us to honor you and follow you. I pray your spirit be living and active and working in our hearts. Jesus, we thank you for dying for us, for redeeming us, adopting us into the family. In your name I pray, amen. Every time I prepare a message, I'm always trying for the first few sentences, in my first few sentences, to do something that grabs hold of your attention. Sometimes. A question, a statement, a story, and I'll do something where I want your attention, right? That's just basic preaching. And today I was chuckling because I was thinking, well, what if, what's going to be my opening line? And I realized I, I don't need an opening line. This one word, submission, has all of your attention. This one word, you're like, what in the world? Why are we talking about this? Where is he going to go? What is he going to say? Does he know? Is he naive? Does he know how much pain has been caused with that word? How much abuse has been caused with that word? Can we like talk about submission to God? Because we can get on board with that. But today, I want to tell you, I always want to choose the harder road. We're talking about submission in human relationships. And you might be thinking, boy, do you know how much tread, like heinous crimes were made with that word. This was told to slaves. This was told to oppressed. This happens in abusive marriages. A, a submission? We're talking about submission? Yeah, we're talking about submission. Here's a couple of reasons, three reasons, and you could jot these down because I think they're worth every bit. Here's why we're talking about submission. Now, it's easy for us to say, let's talk about submitting to God. Now, submission is the giving up of your will, your preference, and your opinion to follow someone else's preference, someone else's way, someone else's will. It's the giving up to follow somebody else. It's the giving up to come under someone else. Now, it's easy for us to say, let's talk about submitting to God. It's interesting how we can sometimes create a dichotomy that sits right with us but is not true. See, 
it's far easier to say let's love God than what? Love your neighbor. Like I would rather submit to my God than to submit to my supervisor. I would rather submit to my God than to submit to my government. I would rather submit to God than to submit to my husband. Now, it's going to get tense. Now, here's the thing. When your yes to Jesus is a yes to Jesus, it will always lead you to a yes to what Jesus has said for how we are to live in human relationships. When you say yes to Jesus, you're also saying yes. If not, Mercy Church, we love Jesus, okay? He is our Lord. He has claimed hold of all of our lives, and all of our lives we're giving up to Him. And when that is the case, we have also said yes to His Word. And in His Word, the Bible speaks often a lot about submission. So when I say yes to Jesus, in some ways I'm also saying yes to my supervisor. And I'm called to say yes to my government. You know, we could say something like, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking about an example, but let's say you came to check out a property and you decided you didn't like one part of that property, like a cottage or a barn on that property. But then you went along and you bought the whole estate. So you ended up with that thing. <laughs> When you said to Jesus, yes, you said yes to the whole thing. But the second thing I want to talk about, second reason, and the first reason is because our yes to Christ must be a complete yes, must encompass all of our lives. But the second reason we're talking about this is because if we remove the abuse that this word can lead to. And we're not talking about that. We're not talking about submission when it leads to harm. When we remove the idea that this word from our mind, from our conversation, from our sermon, the submission, we're talking about immoral things. That's not what it means. You are never called to submit and follow someone when that leads to evil. We are to be obeying God rather than man. When we clarify, and we're not talking about abuse, and don't do that, and we're not talking about immorality, we are still left with a whole lot of territory where speaking on submission is not only appropriate, but biblically mandated. In other words, there's a whole lot of relationships in our lives where submission is appropriate and mandated by Scripture and to live in disregard of it is to live rebelling against the King we love so much. You see, there's a whole lot, and today, everything I'm going to say, we're speaking of those relationships where this subject is appropriate and is biblically mandated. And third, a quick reason why we're talking about this is because I want us to have freedom. Now, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Freedom and that? Like, freedom is the opposite of this. <laughs> I mean, this is when you lose your individuality and your opinions and, 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 and your uniqueness and submission. Like, bro, that's when we stop being free. I want to tell you why it's a gift of freedom. Because it's an incredible gift of freedom to be free from having to have it always my way. Think about that. Think about if you live a life where everything has to be according to your way. How much work that is. How much pain that is. In fact, that's actually a good reason for why we have so much anger. Think about what anger is. Anger happens when you don't get your way. When you're driving on a freeway and somebody's driving slow in front of you, you're like, that's not right. Angry. 
That's just a <laughs> silly example. But I wanted to come home and relax, but my child is sick, so I can't relax. I'm angry. I want it my way. And the way to freedom is working up that muscle. Little yes. Learn, working, up the, working up that muscle, training in the way of submission to the point where I'm okay if I don't have it my way. But you don't get to that freedom. I mean, l- listen, I-, I think I'm saying something you want, I want. Have you ever been jealous of people who are like riding kind of above the storm? Something happens and they're, they're okay? You're like, what is going on with you? How do you do that? You're unbothered, you're secure, you're, you're poised. I want that peace. I want us to have freedom. So we're talking about this because saying yes to Jesus is saying yes in human relationships. We're talking about submission because we still have a whole lot of appropriate relationships where this is mandated. We're talking about submission because freedom is a gift for all of us here today. So we read about this story and I want to give you quickly six areas where Scripture calls us to submit. The first one is government. All right? How are we doing, by the way? This is, this is hard, right? But here's what the Bible says. I, I'm not saying this, okay? Write an email to God, not me. Here's what the Bible says. Is that okay? Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or governor Inslee, I'm just, uh, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Now listen, Mercy Church, I want to thank you something. Hey, we're almost done with masks. Can we just celebrate? Yeah, I can't wait. March 21st. And by the way, <laughs> By the way, I want to thank you, church. You know, that was tough. Most churches were like, hey, it's up to you. We're like, we have to. I don't think we're doing a great job right now, but that's because we're like, we're living in that freedom that's coming. But I just want to thank you so much. I want to thank you so much. Hey, it's been tough. I just want you to know that most people have it far tougher. Like, really? Like, we're talking about a cloth? I'm not going to get on your toes, but somebody's persecuted. And, 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 and right now, when Paul's writing this, the emperor is Nero. He's persecuting the church. So I want you to think that through in your mind as you think about our Inslee, as you think about our Biden, as you think about our government. Because I'm sorry, I know it's super American to like, and it's okay because we live in a democracy and it's good to protest and it's good to vote and you're called to do this and it's a responsible thing to do. But boy, please do remember that you're allegiance is to the Lord who has also said this. Amen? Second thing is to other Christians. Submitting to one another out of reference, reverence for Christ. Uh, this is just in church. I'm going to give up my desires for yours. I'm going to give up my opinions for yours. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to grow with you. I'm here to encourage you. And it's not just the pastor's job. It's everybody's job submitting to other Christians. Now, in that context, the next verse speaks for families and marriages. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Then it talks about Oh, can we go next verse? Marriage, wives, submit to your own husbands, ask to the Lord. Then the next one is for family. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. A lot of us still live here with parents. We're to honor our parents. After family, we see, if we go to the next slide, at work. And now this verse And actually, multiple passages in the New Testament speak of bond servants and masters, but the same principles apply to us in our work areas. And if we go to the last one, 
the church. Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. And those who will, and as those who will give an account, let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that will be of no advantage to you. So we have six areas that the Bible calls us to submit and follow and come under, if we can go to the next slide. Government, other Christians, in marriage, in family, at work, at church. So I want to talk to you today about the story we read. I want to give you five lessons for submission. Five lessons for submission. Five lessons for coming under. See, what we read, we know about David. And at the time that we read this, David was the anointed king. But he wasn't the ruling king. The anointed king, David, beat up the, she, uh, the, the wolf, defeated the bear, then defeated Goliath. And what happened was, was, he still did this when he wasn't a king. And when he defeated all of these Philistines and he had all these victories, the women, the Bible says, were singing a song. And they said that Saul slayed his thousand and David his ten thousands. So Saul, the reigning king, is upset and jealous and angry. And he will give David such a hard time. And what we read was into this pursuit where David is on the run for his life. David finds himself in a cave with his men hiding from Saul. Saul happens to go into the cave to relieve himself. And David had a moment to switch up the arrangement. David had a moment where he could take away the throne from David, uh, from Saul, and put himself on the throne. David had a moment where he could become the master. And David willingly and voluntarily chooses to not do that. He comes under Saul's Reign nonetheless. And I want to talk to you about five principles, five lessons we read from this story for our submission. Lesson number one is we have to know who we're dealing with. In every relationship, we must know who we're dealing with. Now, what David knows is this isn't, isn't just between me and Saul. This, rather, is between me, God, and Saul. See, here's the thing that we got to know, is that in every relationship to which Scripture calls us to walk in the way of submission, it's not just me and my supervisor. It's not just me and my employer. It's not just me and my government. It's not just me and my teacher. It's not just me and my spouse. It's between me, that person, and God. It's not about who my boss is. It's about who my Lord is. It's about who my Lord is. When I start thinking like that, and when I, like, like the moment we forget that, and that's such a simple point, but David understood, hey, I'm not dealing here just one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not just dealing here with another human being. I'm dealing here with God. Imagine having that perspective in all of those areas where Scripture calls us to. You know what it allows us to do? To stop worrying about who this person is, the kind of person they are, how inept they are, how incompetent they are, what kind of jerk they are, and allows us to start thinking about the God we like so much. It, it could even be in, said in such a way that it, don't even think about that person. It's between you and God. God, this is what you've done. This is how you've led me. The second principle, oh, real quick, I want to say that one of my favorite, favorite, favorite sayings in Latin, it's coram deo. It means living in the face of God. That's what we're called to do, living in the face of God. 
The second lesson we learn from this story is that equality does not negate submission. Equality does not remove coming under or the need or the command or the way to come under somebody else. Now here's, picture this. The story sets up with not just one king, but two kings. You have King David, the reigning king, and you have the anointed king, excuse me, the reigning king, King Saul, and the anointed king, King David. We have two kings. We have two equals, perfectly equal. In fact, God was having a preference at this point for David. And David comes and bows to Saul. We tend to believe that in an amazing age like we live in, where equality is the main thing we breathe, that equality somehow means that I don't need to come under anyone. And if I do so, I'm less. If I do so, my worth is less. My dignity is less. My value is less. I'm no longer an image of God. I'm now a servant. I'm, what, what, that's not very, very, very honorable title to have. But we see here that being equals, David and Saul, both kings, and David bows. Can I talk to you about one incredible human being who is also God, Jesus? And Jesus, the Bible says, was equal with the Father. He is equal in every regard with the Father. And yet, all of every moment of his life, he submitted to the Father. Jesus would be an extraordinary case because you know what Jesus said? Jesus says that all authority is given unto me. And this same Jesus who said this did nothing out of his own will, but only submitted to the Father, listened to his human parents, and paid taxes to the government. That's what Jesus did. That's our example. That's our champion. Having all authority, being equal with the Father, he humbles himself. And then when he humbles himself, I mean, he's way superior to us. He's God, we're human, but even still, he would obey his parents. He would ask from his disciple for some money to tax, to give tax. That's Jesus. Don't you ever fall for the lie that if I'm willingly and voluntarily coming under someone and saying yes, that somehow my worth is less. Equality does not negate submission. Here's the third lesson this story teaches us. I think of all the five points, this one is the one, for me at least. Submission is good reasons to say no overcome with one great reason to say yes. Now listen, David is in the cave, and he has good reasons to wipe this guy out. Can we just agree? It's sort of barbaric, but in those days, that's what they did. He has good reasons to kill Saul. Let's talk about the reasons. Number one, he's the anointed one, not Saul. He's the one with the promise that he will be reigning soon. David is. He's being hunted by Saul, making his life miserable. He's the one with the opportunity to settle the score, make God's promise come true, and have peace with it. He has a whole lot of reasons to not follow and come under Saul any longer. Don't be surprised when you have a whole lot of good reasons not to submit. You'll have a whole lot of good reasons not to. And just because you can talk yourself out of it doesn't give you an excuse not to. We're worried or we think, man, I have good reasons not to do this. 
So obviously I won't do this. That's actually going to be very normal. You can always talk yourself out of submission to government, in marriage, in family, at work. He's not really doing well. She's not doing well. He doesn't really know what he's up to. That church is not as good as it should be. That government really sucks. The party that's in. I don't think this is what God would want. I think my opportunity is now. I think I should just pack up my day and pack up my bags and leave this work altogether. I think I should give up on this marriage. I really have good reasons to. David has incredibly good reasons to put to death Saul, to make this over. And he has one great reason not to. He has many good reasons to not submit and one great reason to submit. That reason is that I trust that where I am at in my life right now is God's arrangement for me. And that all timing is God's and all control is God's and the situation I find myself is God's arrangement. This is where God wants me to be. Now think for a moment for us what that can do for us. I have the supervisor that I have. And we're not talking about harm. We're not talking about toxicity. We're not talking about anything immoral. It's just supervisors are tough, okay? I have good reasons to rebel or I can understand that God has my life in his hands and he has me in the arrangement that I'm in with so-and-so as my supervisor. I could be in marriage and I could have a whole lot of reasons and I'm not happy for a whole lot of reasons, but I can see my spouse as God's best for me. I don't believe in soulmates, right? Soulmates, if you're dating, absolutely doesn't exist. Now, if you're married, soulmates exist. It's the one you're married to. Now, imagine seeing your wife or your husband as God's gift to you and that this is where I'm at. And I love the horse I'm on. <laughs> like, this is where I want to be. This is the relationship I find myself in. And yeah, maybe my story had an interesting story to it, but this is where I'm at. It's trusting that what my situation is, is God's arrangement for me. I want you to live with that. You may have many reasons to say no. But may one great reason that I trust God and his arrangement overrule the good reasons for the glory of God and for the love of others. Point number four, submission requires a bow, humility. Now Saul, when he gets out of the cave, and then David gets out of the cave, and David calls out to my Lord, my King, and Saul comes out. Now, notice what David does. The Bible, NIV says that Saul would, uh, David would bow twice before Saul. We cannot submit in relationships we find ourselves in without humility. It's absolutely impossible. In fact, where it's not an issue of harm or abuse, or immorality, the reason we don't submit, let's come on, let's face it, let's get real, is because of pride. It, have, you, like, have you ever been corrected? I've been corrected many times. That's what happens when you're a pastor. And I've trained myself up to be like, okay, you're right. I'm so sorry. I'll work on this. But here's the truth. Never once was it easy. <laughs> Never once did my pride not exist. Every single time, I want to fight, I want to defend, I want to argue, I want to tell somebody something. It's never going to be easy. It's never going to be easy. Submission requires 
Humility. And I think, tend to think that humility or pride, like this is how practically I think about it. It's simply knowing where the debt is. Pride is when you believe everyone else owes you everything. Humility is when you believe or believe you are owed nothing and in return you owe everybody everything. The respect, I owe you that. Encouragement, I owe you that. Love, I owe you that. To count you higher than myself, I owe you that. It's my debt. Or I can live proud. I can live proud. You owe me. You owe me respect. You owe me honor. You owe me comments, compliments. Humility is living, being in debt and indebted to everyone and not requiring others to pay. So when I give up my right to fairness, my right to have it always my way, I humble myself, I bow, that's when we can follow under other people. And last one, lesson number five, and this is so important for you to get, because oftentimes, you know, this passage is read and we hear about promotions, and we hear about how things get better for you when, you when you submit, and how God, that's like a test run for you, and then amazing things will happen. Let's get real. Submission doesn't always lead to any immediate positive results, but it always leads to eternal rewards. If you read this story on, Three, four chapters later, you have no idea the price David paid by not taking Saul out. Because three or four chapters later, Saul is back at it again. And he's pursuing David, and David has to flee again. But this time, David has to flee to an enemy territory with his men, with their wives, with their sons and daughters. And while they are in enemy territory, another raiding group comes in and steals all of their wives, plunders all of their goods, all of their sons and daughters, and leads them out in captivity. David is rock bottom. Not only that, but David's men are ready to kill David. They're fed up with this. It's... And I'm sorry to tell you this, but this is so good for all of us. Submission can sometimes make things a whole lot worse. It can be a whole lot harder to do so. But I want to tell you a couple of things that happen when we do. Number one, you're storing for yourself up, surely, eternal reward. Because submission is ultimately about serving. It's about loving. It's about taking care of someone else. It's about humility. Serving or submission glorifies God. Remember how we talked about it's about God? Well, submission is a declaration to this world that Jesus is precious to me, that Jesus is my Lord. In fact, in one of the passages, it says, submit to governing authorities out of obedience to God. That's what it's about. It's not about so-and-so. It's about our obedience to God and declaring that God is worth everything in my life. Submission gets us to live and be like Jesus. Jesus' signature move his signature characteristic is servanthood. I remember when I was, I had a younger son, Zeke, and he was like two years old or one years old. You would have known he's my son like this. Not because he looks like me. Maybe he does. But because of the thing he did that I did. See, every time I had a ball, the way I played with the ball is in a room, in a conversation. I just lay down on the floor and I just throw it in the air, you know. 
And I would just catch it. And that, that, I would never see anybody else do that. But I would just always throw it, always, 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 everywhere I go. And Zeke, like this 18-month-old, eight, uh, just has nothing, right? Has no arm to throw. But he would play with the ball that way every single time. And that's the only way he thought he would play with the ball. <laughs> you throw it into the sky. That was my signature. Zeke's signature was that. Jesus' signature trait is servant. You want to be like him? Becoming like him in serving. But let me also give you one more benefit. So not only does it lead to eternal rewards, glorifies God, becomes more and more like Jesus, like we're becoming more like Jesus, but also submission has, and we'll be wrapping up right now, transformational potential. We see it in the story. It doesn't last long, but David's act softened Saul's heart. We see here that, let me just read 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3.1. This is in the Bible. Let me just show you that our submission has the power to melt another person's heart. It's a witness. It's love on display. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. That's a principle. That's a principle of how voluntarily and in love, with courage and in strength, I come under someone else and that act has the potential to make a heart of stone tender. It's there. It was in Saul's day. Even in Ephesians chapter 5, it shows us the same dynamic. That it preaches. That it preaches. It shares the gospel with the world. So here's sort of where I want to land In all your relationships, where submission is a legitimate mandate, where could you learn to give up your will for someone else's? Are you always demanding your way everywhere you go, every work meeting, in your family? Is it always your way? In church, it's your way. In family, it's your way. What if we today, as a Mercy Church, would learn the discipline of giving it up? Giving it up for the glory of God, for the love of another, to serve, to be like Christ, giving it up. That is my challenge to you, church. I want to end with this about Jesus. You know how we talked about how submission doesn't always lead to positive results. <laughs> None, uh, no example is better of that than Jesus. Because when he submitted to the Father, that meant the cross. When he submits to the Father, that meant death for him. When he submitted to the Father, that meant going through the pain and the agony and the mockery that human beings, all of us included in those human beings, would lavish on him generously. And yet he did so for the joy. The joy of bringing all of us to himself.
reconciling the world through his son. Jesus paid it all for our eternal life so that when we mess up and when we fail and when our yes to God is an incomplete one and when our lives are filled with anger and selfishness and pride and we don't want to follow anyone, when that happens, we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven. So today, let this be a moment of tremendous grace to you. God loves you. He was perfectly obedient on your behalf. He has forgiven all of your sins. And now today, the cross is also power. Power, strength, courage, energy to be like Jesus. The cross is forgiveness. The cross is also the promise of power to live a life following and being like Jesus. Amen.